Hello everybody, my name is Kevin and welcome to the ESP32 product journey. Today we are going to continue working on the, actually we're not, we're not going to continue working on it. We're going to switch to, last time we were working on the PMIC and the supporting circuitry as you can see here, the resistors and stuff. And we might get to that, but what we're going to switch to is the circuitry around the FTDI chip. And so that is the chip on the uh, hardware that takes a USB signal and converts it to um, serial so that the ESP32 module can understand it. And we use that for a couple things. First and foremost, we use that for programming. We can program it over serial, um, although that's not required because we could just program it over the JTAG connector, I believe. I haven't gotten that far yet, but um, we use it for programming, but also... Um, I've used it in the existing hardware, even though it's not FTDI based, uh, for customers to change settings in uh, on the device so they can plug it into their computer and uh, change settings around it. Now, last stream, I talked about how I thought and I couldn't explain why I was drawing more power from the USB port on the laptop or the computer than I thought I should. And I have done a whole bunch of research on that and I've got some answers for us. So last stream I said I thought, um, and I had remembered this from years ago, that uh, by default you can only draw 100 milliamps of current from a USB port. And if it's a self-powered hub, you can only draw up to 100 milliamps, like regardless, you can't ever draw more than that. And then you can negotiate with the USB host to draw up to 500 milliamps of current. Uh, that's the max for USB 2. And then I believe USB 3, USB 3 has a higher max. I don't remember what that is. Um, but we're, we're designing for lowest common denominator here, even though USB 3 is becoming very popular. We're targeting this to work on everything that has USB 2 because USB 2, USB 3 supports USB 2. And so that should cover us for any device that anybody would have that they would plug this into within the last decade or so. So, uh, and I said, I thought that the host enforced that and it turns out that is not true at all. So that is just a two spec limit. So if you want to get the little, I don't have one on me, but that little like USB logo, like you meet the spec, then they, there's a testing process for that and it ensures that you don't violate any of those guidelines. So the 100 milliamps and the 500 milliamps are actually just spec guidelines that most machines, and I can prove this from my hub to my laptop to other laptops that I've plugged this into, don't actually enforce that. Um, there is nothing in most hardware hosts that says, oh, you've only asked for 100 milliamps, I'm not giving you a milliamp over that. It will draw whatever you pull out of it up to 500 in most in most scenarios. Uh, apparently, if you go over 500, the, the host sometimes will reset or shut down or current limit you. But, um, excuse me, that's not controlled by the host. So when I plug in my current hardware and these dev kits, you know, and they pull two, three, 400 milliamps when they go through the Wi-Fi, it's more like 200. 200, 250 milliamps. Even if it's only asked for 100 milliamps, um, most machines are gonna let that happen. It's not going to current limit based on the spec. But if you were to send this in and say, hey, USB uh, IF, I can't remember what the IF stands for. Like, can you, like, I wanna pay to have this tested and get the official USB logo put on it, say it's USB compliant. They will test those things and they will fail you saying you don't meet spec. And so, I feel a lot better about that now that we found out how that works. And I don't feel good about the fact that our device, our existing pucks and the puck holder as currently designed uh, do not meet spec because if you remember from last episode, the maximum input current that the PMIC will accept currently is I believe 700 milliamps. And uh, I wanna raise that up for the puck holder because we need to charge a bigger battery. And so I can't just have that pool, you know, set that limit to an amp because it'll try and pull as much as I can. And if I tried to charge the battery, I think I'm fairly sure on this. If I tried to charge the new battery and also run the firmware 
on the puck holders with that higher current limit. I'm gonna go over 500, and it seems from reading forums and stuff that that's the limit that most physical hardware devices hosts will cut you off. Like the host will reset, and I'm sure you, it'll depend on the manufacturer of the computer and things like that and the, and the host controller, but um, that would have most likely caused problems. So I'm glad that we dug into this and got it figured out before we did a hardware run, which is gonna cost us a couple hundred bucks, get it back, only to find out when we plug it in and it tries to charge the battery that it's causing all sorts of USB host issues. And um, at worst, with a poorly uh, designed piece of hardware, you might overcurrent it and burn something out. And so um, we I I'm not so interested in being USB compliant to like put the stamp on it, but I don't want to push the spec or violate the spec because if anything goes wrong on some random person's laptop or hardware, um, I want to at least know, cause you have to pay to get it certified and I'm going to, I'm not going to do that at this point. I, I want to at least know, Hey, I'm in spec. And so it should be, you know, it should work perfectly right now. I can't say that like some random person could call in and be like, it's not working on my computer. And I'd have to say like, uh, I, I guess like I'm not actually, going to spec, even though it works for most people. And so what do we do about that? Well, a couple of things. Let's, uh, let's break out the data sheets here. Um, let's get this data sheet and here's the PMIC. And so what we talked about before Let's actually, well, do I want to look at the data sheet? Let's look at the, let's look at the schematic. So we were choosing resistors for the PMIC to control the behavior. Now the timer one, not a big deal. We can change that to set it to whatever time limit we want. No concerns there. The current limit, this 2.2K right here is one that we're going to want to change to raise the current limit so we can pull more current to charge the battery. The set resistor right here is goes into the calculation of what the charge current is. So you've got your max current limit and then you've got your charge current. And so you want to leave enough headroom between your charge current and your set current to run your device. So like it can do the things that it's supposed to do. So we probably need on the order of like three to 400 milliamps for the device just to, to be safe, to give us some headroom. So 400. So if we want the charge current to be we said around four or 500 milliamps, probably 400. If we want that to be 400, we need to leave about 400 to feel comfortable for the device to run, which means we're gonna choose our uh, current limit, this ILIM resistor value to be 800 milliamps. And so max current draw for our device will be around 800 milliamps. And when we plug it into a USB charger, we want it to pull all of that because a lot of those most of those will, will supply at least an amp the problem comes in is when we uh plug that into a laptop or a computer we can't pull 800 milliamps and it won't let us pull 800 milliamps so we have to solve that problem and as i was thinking about that there is no way well there was no way we'll we'll talk more about this in a minute but here's my android charger um it will supply a maximum of two amps. So if I plug in a USB cable to this and then plug in our hardware, we'll be fine. It'll have way more than 800 milliamps to give. It'll charge the battery and run and run the hardware. Excuse me, sorry. But if I've got, here we go. Here's the USB cable that comes with the, the device. If I plug this into here, and then I plug this end into the holder. How do I know that this is a Android phone charger as opposed to me just plugging this into my laptop? I'm gonna get five volts, I'm gonna get ground, and then there's a data plus and data minus line that the charger is not going to provide. But from a schematic hardware perspective, how do we determine that we're connected to a charger that can give us more than 500 milliamps? versus a, a hub or a laptop port or a 
you know, a, a desktop port that can't give us more than 500 milliamps. And so that was the problem that I was researching. And the PMIC gives us a few things. And so let's, let's look at those briefly. First of all, we can, you know, we have all these resistors that we can set the, you know, to set those currents. But we also have this right here, this, uh, let's zoom back in, chip enable. Uh, or, or charge enable it might be. But anyway, th this line right here, let's just look at it in the data sheet. There we go. And let's zoom right on in. Chip enable, uh, charge enable. CE is common for chip enable. Uh, active low input. Connect CE to a high logic level to disable battery charging. Um, connect CE to a low logic level to enable the battery charger. And it says CE is internally pulled down. Uh, do not leave CE unconnected to ensure proper operation. So we want it to be low to enable the charger, high to disable it. So we could, and as you can see, I just have it tied to ground through a 100K resistor. And so in our current layout, it is charging is always enabled. There is no disabling of charging. And so what we have here is a way that we could disable charging if we um, controlled this more dynamically versus just statically tying it to ground. So we have that from the PMIC. But again, when we're connected, how do we determine, how does the PMIC determine, hey, I'm connected to a USB charger versus I'm connected to a laptop? Um, we got to figure that out. The other options that we have, the other pins that we have to deal with here are enable one and enable two. And so let's look at those in the data sheet. These are the input current limit configuration inputs. And so we can, uh, there's actually a nice little table right here that says, you know, if they're both zero, the maximum income input current is limited to 100 milliamps. And so that is by USB spec, 100 milliamps is the you're good to go current for anything, whether it's a hub or a direct port on a machine. If you draw 100 milliamps or less, there's nothing you need to do. You don't need to negotiate for more power. It's just you're you're good to go. So you can connect anything into a USB port and safely pull 100 milliamps per spec. Now, if you have uh, EN2 low and enable one high that limits it to 500 so that's saying hey you're in um you're in that max usb2 range of you can pull up to 500 milliamps and then uh one zero is set by an external resistor and one one is standby usb suspend mode so usb suspend mode as i learned has some special requirements where you are not allowed to draw more than 2.5 milliamps of current so that's common when your, um, like if your laptop or your desktop goes to sleep, it'll suspend all of the USB devices. And at that point, again, per spec, you can only pull two and a half milliamps. Most devices, as it turns out, don't follow that. And so they, they relax some of the requirements around that. But this is why, like, if you put your computer, your laptop to sleep, but leave like a hub plugged in with a, you know, a mouse or whatever, the battery is going to drain significantly overnight because a lot of devices don't properly go into the standby requirement of drawing less than two and a half milliamps of power of current. And so again, this setting this to one, one, I'm guessing limits the maximum input current. I'm not sure why they don't say it here to two and a half milliamps. And so as you can see, depending, are you connected to a, a dedicated charger or an actual USB host, and then what mode is that host in? Are you running in 100 milliamp or 500 milliamps? And you can't really set it to zero one to be 500 milliamps because while that's fine to just plug into like my laptop port here, I can negotiate up to 500 milliamps. If I plug it in and I've got a USB 2 hub connected to this machine right now, if I plug it into that, all bets are off. I have to limit it to 100. And so it's not even just, am I connected to a charger or am I connected to a port? It's, am I connected to a charger or a port? And then if I'm connected to a port, is it a hub that I can only draw 100? Or is it an, a direct port that I could draw up to 500? Like, these are sort of impossible to figure out. And so we kind of have to design around least common denominator here. And so 
these are the settings that we have. And as you can see, let's go back to our, our hardware. Enable one and enable two, if we come over here a little bit. Enable two is pulled high, enable one is pulled low. So enable two high, enable one low. We're in this configuration right here, which means our maximum input current is set by the um, current limit resistor as we talked about last time. So it's this resistor right here. And so that 2.2K resistor determines how much current our device as a whole will consume through the PMIC. And the PMIC is really the entry point of the hardware. So it, it determines how much current is drawn from the USB, uh, micro USB port that's on it. The battery is tied straight to out when it's using the battery. So it'll pull three amps from the battery if it wants. So all of these values apply when we're drawing current from the USB, the micro USB port that's on the hardware. And so we have to use these pins that we have available, the CE, the charge enable, enable one and enable two, to make sure that when somebody plugs our device into a, a USB port, that we're under the limit. And what I think I'd like to do the device is meant to be battery powered. So it's not meant to be plugged into a USB port and run like some other devices would be. Like your, your mouse, if it's wired, is, you know, it operates plugged in all the time. The only time you would plug the puck holder into a computer is to change the configuration of it, load firmware on it, and maybe charge it, but we can steer people away from that in instructions. Like don't charge it from a computer, charge it with your phone charger. And so I think, I've been thinking about this all day. I think what I'd like to do is just limit the current draw to 100 milliamps if it's connected to a host, whether that's a hub or a direct port, which means at that point, we can't even enable Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi and transmitting packets is going to shoot us over that easy, like 150, 200 milliamps easy. And so it would essentially limit the device to just those couple of scenarios when it's plugged into a USB host. And I, th I think I'm okay with that because, again, programming it and configuring it is going to be done through an app or through a web browser. And so it doesn't need to be plugged into a computer to do that. And so I really think the only time we'd ever need to <clears throat> do that is if, like I said, we want to make configuration change. But the, the point of that is, is if we can hard limit the current when it's in that mode, we can't skirt around the spec. Cause like right now we're, we're getting around the spec. Like I plug this thing in, it's going to pull two, three, 400 milliamps and nothing happens. At least on my machine, it doesn't crash anything or reset the USB host. And so you could soft limit it and say, I'll just try in firmware to, you know, not turn the Wi-Fi on or not do other things that, that increase current draw and try to keep it below a hundred. Or we could do some crazy things with the resistors here to set a hard limit in those cases of saying we're not going to use more than 100, just can't, physically can't draw more than 100 milliamps. I think that's what we should do. That's what we're going to do. Decision made. That's it. Uh, we're going to do that. We're going to, I think, we're going to try to do that, I should say. So let's go. Uh, that's the PMIC. Now let's, we need to pull up another data sheet. And this is the other stuff that I was researching today. Uh, FT, I think it's 230X is the chip that we're using. What are we doing? We're like right here. We can just look it up. Pull up our bill of materials here. It's one of the U chips. Here we go. Uh, F FT231XC, uh, XQ, sorry. Okay. Cancel. So let's pull up the data sheet for that because I learned some things about this chip today that I think will get us what we're trying to do. Uh, data sheet. Okay, where's, oh, documentation, here we go. 
Okay. And let's blow it up so everybody can read it. If we come down here. Oh, here you go. See this certified USB? Like you've seen that on products before. That's what I was talking about earlier. To be USB compliant and get that certified. So the FTDI chip is certified, but to have this be on like uh, this this logo be on your product box or whatever packaging, you actually have to go through a certification process. You have to pay the USB foundation like money and um and they and, and get tests done to make sure that you meet all these different requirements. And so if you're pulling more than 100 milliamps, you're not meeting that requirement. Um, and again, lots of things do this. A lot of maker kits like just messing around like these ESP32 and 8266 dev kits, not to spec, but they work, right? And so, hey, King, how's it going? So let's come down and look at the hardware lines that we have to use on our FTDI chip. So pretty simple. This USB data minus and data plus, those are the data lines from the USB. And for those that might not know, I had somebody recently reach out and ask me about this. Um, some people think, so inside of a USB cable, there's typically four wires, sometimes five on, on USB two cables. There's, there's five volts, ground, data plus and data minus. Um, somebody thought that you could take the data plus and data minus and use those as like the TX and RX on like an Arduino or an ESP32, like those are not interchangeable. The data plus and data minus lines on the USB cable are not transmit and receive. Uh, USB works on a completely different uh, philosophy. Instead of just ones and zeros, the, the data comes across those lines as a voltage differential. So the, the difference in voltage between data plus and data minus is what um, determines the data that's coming down the line. So don't try and open up a USB cable, take the, I think it's green and white, the green and white wires and connect them to RX and TX. That's not going to work. Um, <clears throat> oh, sweet. So what we're trying to do here, uh, King is we're trying to build an ESP 32, uh, internet of things product. So designing from scratch and, uh, building this all up to release as a basically a consumer product based on an ESP32 module. So um, like the Arduino, just uh, a little more production uh, ready, but same concepts, um, basically uh, just a little bit more involved in, you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's, I guess you'd say. Um, so we've got the data plus data minus coming into the FTDI chip. And, oh, and sorry to, to inform you, what we're trying to do today is solve us violating the USB spec about how much current we're drawing from a USB port. Because right now we draw too much, the computer won't stop us from drawing too much, and we're trying to fix that. So, and then we also have VCC and ground, which is, you know, the five volts. But we also have, oh, and then on the output side, the, the FTDI, the main purpose of the FTDI chip is to take those data plus and data minus lines from your USB cable and turn them into TX and RX. So again, you can't, you can't just do that, but there's chips like the FTDI that do that conversion for you. And so this TX and RX, TXD and RXD are what we connect out to our ESP32 and the ESP32 talks serial. And so that's how that works. So we take this chip has some code built into it that enumerates it on your um, computer when you plug it in to show up as a virtual COM port and it turns your USB data into transmit and receive. And then you also have these like ready to send, clear to send. I think that's what those are. We actually use these to help facilitate programming, but I'm not gonna go into what those are right now. And then the other thing that I ignored before, but I think we're gonna to need to use are these CBUS 0, 1, 2, and 3 lines. And these are configurable pins to allow us to do several things. And so we'll, we'll uh, let me show you that. So it says configurable CBUS IO pin. You can see there's four of them on this chip. Function of this pin is configured in the device MTP memory. And if we go down just a little bit more, there's a table 
of what we can configure the CBUS pins to do. And we do this by setting a value in the memory of the FTDI chip, and that will configure and determine how those CBUS pins act. And so you can see if we set the option to be tri-state, all four of them will just be tri-stated. Tri-state means it's not gonna be high or low, it'll be um, floating essentially is what we call it. We could do drive one, which means all of them are a constant output. Uh, when you set the, the, the option for the CBUS pin, like if you set CBUS zero to be drive one, it will always output high voltage, like 3.3 volts. And if you set CBUS one option to be drive zero, it'll always be held to ground. And so these are the options, options that you have. And you have different things like this, like TX LED, which means you could connect an LED to that CBUS pin and you'll get that sort of like flashing, you know, that it's communicating, it's transmitting and receiving. Uh, you've got sleep, uh, clock, you can get a 24 megahertz clock output. So you could use the FTDI chip to drive the clock of another MCU, like a PIC microcontroller or something like that. And so a bunch of different options here. Now, um, it doesn't matter what the default is because the default is not what we want because what we're interested in are a couple of these that are not enabled by default. And the first one of those is this power enable. And what it says is output is low after the device has been configured by USB, then high during USB suspend mode. <coughs> what a lot of things do, and there's an example later in the data sheet of this, is you can connect this to a MOSFET that essentially activates the power to the rest of your device. We're not going to do that, but this any one of these, so any one of these, CBUS 0, 1, 2, or 3 could be configured to represent power enable. And interestingly enough, multiple could be as well. So like if you wanted CBUS 3 and CBUS 2 to have this functionality, you just configure them to do that. And so each of the CBUS lines can be configured to do any of the things that are listed here. And so I think that would be helpful because that means we can get from the FTDI chip an indication that it that something has enumerated it. So it says after the device has been configured by USB. This will only happen if you've connected to a host. If you connect it to a charger like this, this is not a USB host. It's just for charging. And so it will not enumerate. So power enable will never be pulled low. So that's a, a simple way or one way that we could tell, hey, are we connected to a charger, a dumb charger, or are we connected to an actual hub or directly to a port? So I think we're gonna need power enable. Sleep is another one, goes low during USB suspend mode. Now, this is one that we could use if we wanted to know the difference between I'm running in a USB mode, but now I should be in sleep mode and pull that current draw down to two and a half milliamps. I'm not gonna worry about, no, I take that back. I am gonna worry about that. Cause again, we wanna be to spec. So this would be like, maybe we'd, we would connect the sleep output here to that charge enable pin on our PMIC so that when it goes to sleep, we disable charging completely, um, which means we'll definitely pull less than the charge current, but we still need to draw the current way back. This might also be something that we'd want to connect to one of those enable pins. Like at some point, we're gonna to have to figure out what the combination of FTDI pins to PMIC pins that will create all of the scenarios. And we're probably gonna to have to, we're gonna to have to write these down and figure it out. So sleep is one that we'll probably use as well. The one that I'm really interested in is this BCD charger line. And that says battery charge detect in detect indicates when a, the device is connected to a dedicated battery charger. And from the reading that I've done today on this, I don't know how reliable this signal will be. And so we're probably going to have to do a bunch of testing on it. But like, I'm imagining if I plug it into this, that it will detect that it's a, ba a dedicated battery charger, but you might have some other device that's not, um, you know, that's not to spec because this is, 
battery charge detect, from what I've read, it only applies if the charger also conforms to the USB battery charging spec. So just like all of the makers of these boards don't really follow the true spec for power draw, I'm guessing a lot of chargers also don't follow the spec. And so you might not get an accurate read by just looking at the BCD charger line. And then BCD charger pound um, is the inverse of BCD charger. So this one, uh, active high output means when it detects a charger, it will go high. If you set it to BCD charger pound, the output would pull low. And that's, again, the reason for that is because a lot of these uh, PMIX have like this line above it, chip enable. So pound and line, this is a, something that you'll need to learn if you're looking through data sheets and looking at schematics and stuff. You can see timer here has no line above it. Charge enable has the line. The line above, as, as do P good and charge over here, the line above indicates that it's active low, almost universally. There may be some exceptions, read the data sheet, but that means to indicate that charging is enabled, we want the opposite of high is on, low is off. So low is on, high is off. And that's why we pull charge enable to ground because it's active low. That's what that line means. Same thing with the pound. Anytime you see this pound symbol after something, that's another way to indicate it's active low, not active high. And so that's just, you know, something to remember as you're looking through data sheets and things. Okay, so uh, keep away. Um, we're probably not interested in it either. But um, where is it? Oh, yes, let me find it. The thing that I think is going to help us the most, I came across today. And that is this application note from FTDI. Again, as you're going through all of this stuff, the data sheet is crucial to understanding how everything works and making sure you've got everything wired up correctly. Most companies that offer um, different kinds of chips will have application notes. And if you're trying to use their chip to do it, they've probably already done it. And you should find the application note that shows how they did it because they'll have a lot of great guidelines and you don't have to reinvent the wheel or do something wrong. And I think that's what we've run across here. So let's look at it. Application note AN175, battery charger detection over USB with FTX devices. And that's what we're using. We're using an FT231XQ. Uh, and this is great. And I will show you what I mean by that. And that's our description. Okay. CBUS signals used in battery charging application. And then they, they go through and they, they, they rehash here. So they're suggesting, you know, use CBUS 0, 1, 2, and 3 as these things, BCD, um, inverse, power enable. Again, that pound means active low, sleep, active low, power. And they use power enable twice here. And the, the application note is assuming that you're connecting to an LTC 4053 EDD LiPo battery charger. Now, we are not connected to an LTC 4053. We're connected to our BQ... 275, I think it is. Uh, BQ24, uh, 24074. So, but the the application, the, the fundamentals are the same. Um, you can see on the LTC 4053, there's a program line that uses resistors to determine how much charge current, and it also has a shutdown. That's gonna be like our, our charge enable line. So there's a lot of similarities between uh, the chip that they use in the application note and the BQ chip that we're using in our application. And so if we come down here, it'll say CBUS signals used in the battery charging application. And it basically says right here, like uh, use this to select resistance value on prog pin for one amp charging. And this is what blew my mind today, which is, I was selecting a single resistor to set all of these limits on our charging, on our PMIC. What they've done here is 
they're using BCD. They've got a 1.5 K resistor. That's that 1 K5 means um, 1500 ohm connected to a 16.5 kilo ohm resistor down here. Now, by default, when this is high, it'll be floating, which means we can get rid of this. Like we cross out this 1.5 K resistor up here and the programming current will only be set by this resistor. But when the charge detect goes low, it's going to add in this one, one and a half K in parallel, which doing some resistor math, which I won't go through right now, changes the resistance that the program pin sees and therefore changes the available charge current. And so using some resistor tricks like this connected to pins that connect to ground or not, we can, we can change what that charge current is based on what we're connected to. And that's really cool. That's not something I considered. So we could use resistor networks like this connected to the output CBUS pins on the FTDI chip to change the charge current. So if we wanted to say, when I'm connected to a charger, I want to charge current with 400 milliamps. When I'm connected to a USB host, I only want to charge with you know 50 milliamps because I want to be under that 100. We can do that doing some resistor tricks like this. It's really cool. Got in order to start learning this stuff. Uh, so resources to get started on this stuff. Oh, that's a great question. So it sounds like you've played with Arduino. Highly recommend that. Um, there's just lots and lots of resources about Arduino available. And then uh, sparkfun.com has a lot of resources. Adafruit.com has a lot of resources for getting started. Uh, Instructables has a lot of resources for getting started. So uh, King, depending on what you want to do, like there's lots and lots of uh, resources to get started with simple maker projects. Hackster.io is a great re resource as well for projects that other people have done and documented. So um, plenty of plenty of resources out there to help you um, <clears throat> to get started. Okay, so in this first description, it shows using all four of the CBUS pins, but then it's really cool. It says, uh, let's see. USB, it goes through different scenarios of like USB host port not enumerated. Like it shows the states that things will be in at different, at different times in the like connection life cycle. Like when you first plug it in, regardless of if you can get 500 milliamps, it, you, you have to limit it to 100 milliamps until you have properly enumerated and requested the allocation for 500 milliamps. So like making sure that you're drawing the right current through all of those phases, it, it talks you through exactly how to do it. And then it says MTP memory settings. Uh, where was it? Okay, here we go. Reduced CBUS pin count. It says like, hey, maybe you don't have, you can't use all four CBUS pins for whatever reason. Maybe your, your main um, chip can't use all of them. So it'll say, here's how you can do it with three CBUS pins. Go down. Here's how you can do it with just two C bus pins, you know, and it, it explains what the trade offs are, like what you can't do. And then all the way down to here's how you can do it with just one C bus pin. And it says, you know, you should pick uh, which one you should pick and how it works, and even gives you an example circuitry. This application note is exactly uh, what I was looking for. And so I still need to read through this, but I get the general idea, which is I need to decide how much current I'm going to draw, which we did earlier, 100 milliamps, and how we want to enforce that because, again, I only want to enforce that when I'm connected to a host and not when I'm connected to a charger. And so I will figure that out and then explain it as part of the stream. I'm not going to figure it out right now. But the other thing that I do want to work on right now is to do this, let's come back over here. I think it's section eight of the data sheet. Yes, it is. Okay, internal MTP memory configuration. And so this is the internal memory that's on the FTDI chip. It has the USB vendor, uh, the VID and PID, which is great. It's got a 
factory unique serial number burned in that you can use for something, which is pretty cool. Then if we come down here, it says by default, when it enumerates, it only requests 90 milliamps. Now, this is where things start to get pretty cool. I'm gonna bring a terminal window over here, right here. And I think I still have it. So on Linux, which is what I'm running right now, there's um, equivalence to this on Mac and Windows, but if you run LS USB, if you have the USB dev stuff installed, it will show you every device that is connected through USB. And some of these might surprise you like the integrated camera. Um, this is the webcam that you're looking at me, looking that you can see me through. <laughs> that's a USB device, but like the integrated camera, the multi-touch sensor, that's the touchpad on my laptop. It's actually a USB device. You know, it's not, you don't plug it into a port, but internally it's routed to a USB device. This Zoom digital recorder is connected to the hub that's connected to my laptop. So that's a USB device. So, and you can see right here, this 2.0 root hub, I believe, well, I can't tell which one because I've got a couple of them, is, is that external USB 2 hub. Oh, it actually might be this right here. I think the root hubs are the ones that are built into the laptop. And then this micro corp USB hub is probably that external one that I have plugged in. So you can see all of the devices. Now, if we change that command a little bit to run a little bit of grep, uh, well, I, before we do the grep, let's just do dash V and you'll see it'll output a whole bunch of information about every single device. And so let's just, uh, let's pick one here, like the webcam. Let's find the webcam. Optical mouse, that's that hub. It's gonna be up a little ways. USB streaming, okay, the microphone is good. So it's got audio control. It'll talk about the descriptors and things like that. Um, it'll have the, yeah, his, this is the H4 zoom that I'm using as the mic. You can see that it's vid and pid is right here. The manufacturer serial, um, and then it has configuration description descriptors. This piece of information right here is pretty interesting. Max power. If you remember when I was talking to you about how USB devices negotiate with the host on power usage, again, the host doesn't enforce it, but it's a way to let the host know this is how much power I need so that the host can then say, hey, I've got so many things plugged in, I can't give you more power. And then the OS can actually give you uh, warnings when you plug in something if you've exceeded your like the amount of power that the hardware can deliver. And that's gonna be different for every laptop, desktop, um, the amount of power that the host can deliver. Because remember, you can chain USB devices on and on and on. I could plug a hub into my hub and a hub into that hub and just start connecting you know, lots and lots of devices. The single port on the laptop or the desktop can only source so much current. It's not, a, it's not an infinity current source. But, so this max power, tells you how much that the device has told the, the USB host, this is how much I need to operate. And I promise you, I'm not gonna use more, even though most devices, like dev kits, I should say, not, not official devices, most like non-certified dev devices use more. Okay, now let's use our eGrip. So if we take that output, pipe it into eGrip and look for bus max power and hit enter, we get a lot, smaller output and you can see um, it for each device. So like the integrated camera, max power 500, max power. And then this real tech is asking for 800. Again, you can see USB three, I believe 900 is the max. It might even be 800, but it's not 500. But most of these you can see are 500. Here's one that is 100. One of them was 98, which I think is really funny. This is my wireless mouse and keyboard. A dongle that I have plugged in. So pretty cool. Now let's take our hardware that we've built and let's plug it in and see what it says. Because according to the data sheet, max bus power current from our FTDI chip is 90 milliamps. So this is where it's fun to see like the data sheet manifest itself in real life. And so this actually goes to sleep after about 10 seconds, if you remember from last time. So I'm gonna plug it in, and I'm gonna hit up, get the power, 
And then I'm going to pull it out. Let's see. So if we scroll up here, aha, right here, this is a new device that we didn't see last time. Future Technology Devices International, FTDI. And you can say it's a, uh, you can see it has some extra things here, but look at this. Max power, 90 milliamps. <clears throat> I should have brought some water, sorry. So really cool. Like the default for the FTDI chip is to request 90 milliamps. And that's what we're actually seeing in our operating system on our device that we connected to. So that's really cool. And the point of this is this is in MTP memory. And so we can change this value again, all the way up to 500 for USB 2 devices. So we could change the max current. And the reason I don't want to go above 100 is because, again, even though you can request 500, if you plug it into an unpowered hub, you're not allowed to go over 100, um, which is really weird because a device can't know. Like, this hub that I have could be powered by, like, a, an external power supply, or it could not be, which is the configuration that I have it in. There's no way for a device to know. Like, it just knows I'm connected to something that knows USB. And so even if we said the max bus current is 500, <clears throat> I don't know, I'll have, to, I'll have to think more about that. Like we'd still violate that if we've connected it to an unpowered hub, I guess is what I'm saying. You can change the power source to be self-powered instead of bus powered, in which case none of this stuff matters because you tell the host, I don't need any of your power because <clears throat> I got all my own power. Which maybe, maybe that's what we want to do. Because again, if we're just using this to do program and configuration stuff, the battery can supply the power. Nope, I don't like it. I hate it. Because that's going to kill the battery to configure it. No, no, we're not going to do that. We're sticking with 100 million. Let's keep going. And then down here, here you go. <clears throat> CBUS. 0, 1, 2, and 3. And you can see the default is that um, transmit, enable the LED output. And so by default, I could hook up little LEDs to the CBUS pins to get the flashing like I was talking about earlier. And then CBUS 3 is sleep. So, recap. Let's zoom out here. Power comes into our device through this PMIC. And we have some ways to limit the amount of current that comes through it and enable charging or disable charging. And all we have to do to control that is toggle these lines and connect them to certain resistors. Elsewhere in our circuit, back over here, USB comes in. We come into here. This is our FTDI chip. We have CBUS pins over here that can give us information about what we're connected to, whether it's a charger or a USB host device. And we can use that information to help us limit the amount of current that our PMIC will draw, as well as if it will charge the battery and with how much current it will charge the battery. However, to do that, we need to change the MTP memory on the FTDI chip to configure these CBUS pins to do something different than what they are default configured to do. Cause we need access to that like BCD uh, sleep. We'll probably use power enable. We need to have as well for sure. Uh, again, we have this sweet application note that gives us a, a pretty great idea. Um, right, not right there. One of these, uh, oh, come on. This gives us a pretty good idea of how we can connect all that up to our PMIC, the FTDI and the PMIC, to give us exactly what we're looking for, to be USB compliant, but also charge our battery efficiently when we're connected to a charger. But we need to configure the pins to allow us to do that. <clears throat> and that is mostly done, as you can see through the application note, through this program called FTProg. And if you're familiar with the look, that doesn't look like a Linux window to me. That's got Windows written all over it. So FTProg is a Windows program. And <clears throat> 
something that we have to consider as part of this. Like right now, when I get this hardware back from China, I don't have to do anything except program the ESP32, which I can do again over the USB port that's on it. What we're seeing now is to make this more compliant and more you know electrically correct as a device that plugs into USB. We also need to program the little chip right up here on the tip of my finger, this little square guy up here, that needs to be programmed as well. And so now we're increasing the complexity of programming our device. Now, if we can get that to a point where it's just plug it in and it gets programmed, that's great. But we have to figure that out. So that's the next step is I want to figure out how to read the MTP memory and then program it with Linux preferably because what I'd like to get to, excuse me, is right now I use a Raspberry Pi to program these things, which is a really, really inexpensive programming rig, right? A few bucks and I'm up and running and I can program these things one after another. Would it be the end of the world if I had to have a Windows machine on hand to do that? No, but I'm a big Linux fan. And I, if I can do all of this through Linux, I feel like that's better. Like I just, the overhead of requiring Windows to program these devices is not something that I want to do. And so we need to figure that out. And so it is King, how like amazing, how small these circuits are and how all the things they can do. It's like truly incredible. Um, it's amazing. Any of this stuff ever works. Um, so without a windows, so I guess I can hear, you know, somebody watching probably saying like, Oh, just use wine to run a windows program under Linux. I, I, I don't know why I just hate it. I hate that. It just feels wrong to run a non-native program through that. And I guess I could use a virtual machine as well. I don't know. Yeah, I just, I don't want to do, I, I'd rather not, you know, that's an option. I could use wine. Um, I could just get a windows machine program it that way. Uh, but I don't want to do that. I would rather figure out a way to do this straight Linux that allows us to do that. And the, the first stop of that, it needs to be fast too. Like I need to be able to, I'd like to have a batch script at the end of all this that programs a puck holder in a matter of seconds, like less than 10 seconds. I want to be able to plug it in less than 10 seconds, done, move on to the next one. Because the idea is I'm gonna have to be programming hundreds of these. Okay, so the first step in that, that I wanted to try and accomplish, and my voice is starting to, I've been talking a lot, but I feel like this has been great information to talk through. What I wanna figure out, and I think an easy way to do that is right back up here, this value right here. If I can read this value and then change it and then come back over to here and see it reflected here, that will give me a high amount of confidence that I can, first of all, read the memory and then program the memory. And then it's just a matter of figuring out, okay, how do I set the C bus pins to the way I want them to be? And once I can prove that that all works with this device, <clears throat> I will move on to the next step of figuring out which CBUS pins to connect to which um, PMIC pins, like charge enable and the resistor network and stuff to get the charging scenarios that we want to enable. Make sense? Probably not. Like I said, a lot of things there and it's all up here in my head. I'm trying to get it out and share it. Uh, with everybody. <clears throat> so I did very little research on this and let's see how far we can get quickly. So let's do FT prog Linux. Somebody had actually created this guy right here. What's the difference between these two things? The thing that I got worried about when I first saw this is you can see this right here, eight years ago, eight years ago. There are some 10 months ago here. And I guess that's an FTC prog. So 10 months ago. So it's, you know, it's it's staying up-ish to date. What's this one though? 
oh, eight years ago, eight years ago. Okay, so this is even older. All right. Let's try and use this. I think I have all of these things installed. Let's pull it. Let's grab the code. Copy. Let's do... Uh, dev. Let's do git clone that. Okay. CD into FTX prog. And let's do actually this. Let's do code dot. Uh, do I want to do it this way though? Maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna slide this over for now. And yeah, no kidding, King. I I sure hope this works. Cause if this works, like we don't have to look any further, and we'll be all set, and we'll be able to you know program and move along with what we have. So let's let's look through here. Um, we'll just follow along here. So we're in the thing. I think I have everything installed. But the only thing I might not is apt. Actually, you don't have to do it anymore. It's just apt install uh, lib ftdi dev. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna need that. I have build essential, I have GCC, and I have make, and so just the libftdi dev, great. And we're in the folder, so let's do uh, make, see what happens. That was crazy fast. And there I have it, FTX prog. Oh my goodness, if this works. Uh, I'm imagining you have to do sudo because it needs root access to do some of the things it's trying to, oh, and I don't have, let's, um, we need to do something else here first. Sorry, let's, uh, let's open our Arduino. Okay, here's our sketch from last time. We don't need to take up the whole screen. Uh, instead of having this deep sleep, I'm gonna, I'm gonna comment that out actually. And, I will, I'm gonna not do serial begin. And let's, uh, I'm gonna program that. Upload. It's gonna build it. And it's gonna program it, great. Okay, so that should be running. And let's do, Okay, it's gonna give us the help menu, great. So that looks super promising. And then over here it says we just run dump and it should show us the existing settings. Oh man, okay. Okay, this is looking really good. Let's come back over. Uh, don't continue yet. Um, shoot, here, let's, let's, sorry. Let's pull this guy over. So he's just half the page. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure this so that everybody can see. And then I'll put this right above my head. Hopefully it's big enough. And then let's look here. Let's come back up to the top. Prop version, great. FT1248, I don't know what that means. RS45, I2... Wait, rewriting EEPROM with new contents? No, I don't wanna do that. But let's look at it here. Like, um, CBUS0 is TXDEN, CBUS1 is RXLED, which is correct. Um, CBUS2 is TXLED. It doesn't have the pound, but I think that's okay. CBUS3 is sleep. And then I don't even have a CBUS 4, 5, and 6. I don't know why it says Tri-State. So that's really cool. Maximum current supported from USB, 90 milliamps. 
So I'm going to say no to this because I don't want it to try and reprogram. So that's really cool. It looks like it's working. So the question now is how do we program it to let's again, let's just start with trying to program a higher um, max current. Like let's just change it to like a hundred and let's just change it to a hundred. It would be cool to see that. Another thing that would be really cool once we if we can get this to work is this like uh, manufacturer name or product description, like we could change this to be product specific for us. We can need, we can leave the, you don't wanna change the vid and PID because that is used by the operating system to say, hey, I have a virtual COM port driver for that vid PID. So you can actually, and I did this years ago, I still have a an issued vid and PID that I can use personally for my projects because they have to be universally unique across all devices on the planet. Um, I could do that, but if I change these to be my vid and PID that I got issued by the USB foundation, then the driver won't automatically load and we would break the virtual COM port that is opened up automatically. And so what's really cool, uh, yeah, King, this I will upload this to YouTube. I, I upload all the episodes to YouTube when I'm done. So as soon as I finish this, like I export it over, it's on YouTube. You can follow me over there. Actually, I'll give you a link to it if you want to check it out. Um, YouTube.com slash microcast, I believe. Throw it in the chat for you. Let's see. Yeah, there you go, man. Check it out there. Cool. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so how do we change it? Uh, so to finish that thought, don't mess with the vid and PID. It's gonna mess up how the OS automatically creates the handy virtual COM port for you. Uh, no, that's not what I want. Uh, yes, this is what I want. Okay, CBUS pin sets up configurable CBUS with a particular function. Inverting, yeah, the possible pins are, okay. I know about these FTX silicon errata. All right, let's, the thing I'm worried about too on this is bricking it, like getting it into a state that messes me up. But let's just do, can I just do like help? And then let's actually look through it. Oh, look at all that good stuff. Dump EE prom settings, show debug output, save, save, oh. Oh, save original contents to file. Cool, let's just try that really quick. Um, Save. Do we get to specify a file? Yeah, file. So let's do save dot slash settings dot text. Rewriting EE problem with new contents. Like, no, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't know why it asked that. It's weird. No. Did I get a settings dot text? I did. Um. Maybe a binary file, see it, oh, uh, no. Let's just see what it looks like in code. Okay, so it it exports it as, yeah, okay. Uh, I think I have like a hex edit, show hex dump. There you go, all right, yeah, so it's just, it's just the raw, raw data. And you can see this is like the manufacturer descriptor and stuff like that, but otherwise it's just ones and zeros, okay. All right, cool. Let's remove that. Remove right protected, yes. Uh, okay, let's go back to help. Okay, so that was cool. 
save, restore from file. So like we could, once we got one of these configured, and this is where I'm looking at in terms of programming things. Once we got one of these configured, we could save it out to a binary file and then use that as part of a script. We don't have to go in and set each individual setting because again, oh, but the, the serial, the serial number. Current serial number of device to be reprogrammed. New serial number. So. Um, yeah, let's just mess around with some of this stuff. Let's do dash dash. Manufacturer missing arguments. Oh, that's to set it. New manufacturer number. Yeah, okay. So that's to set it. Product, set it. Old serial number. Oh, current serial. So if you wanted to do. So what was the serial number? Kind of like to see that remote wake up allows the interface to be woke. Okay, so you can set OVCP protocol, I2C addresses, old vid, old PID to be reprogrammed, erase, dbus config, cbus config. Okay, cool. And then cbus, this is how you set it. Okay, that's really cool. I, I still want to let's let's do dump again. Dump. All right. It's just pin allocated to FIBA since vendor ID, USB. Where is the serial number? That's what I would like to see. USB version. Am I just missing it? Does anybody see serial number here? Anybody at all? No. So, oh, a serial number. Look at that. Right there. Okay. Cool. That seems really short to be. Well, I guess there's it's alphanumeric time is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight times uh, 36 to the eighth power. I guess that's a lot of devices. <laughs> okay, so that's yeah, that's probably easily universally unique. Um, okay, great. I don't know why that's under the section RS485. That feels a little weird to me, but that's okay. I would have expected it to be up here, and I want to change this to 100 milliamps. How do we do it? Self-powered, specify if chip is bus powered or self-powered. What was the default on that again? Uh, what happened to our data sheet? What was it? I don't know, it's in here, it's in section eight. Power source, bus powered. Yeah, okay. Oh, and it's this. It's insane. I just opened up the same data sheet. That, that's the indicator that it's almost time to end the stream because I'm starting to lose my mind. Okay, so we don't want to change self-powered. We want to change... No, we go suspend max bus power. Right there. Okay, let's do it. Max, it's, how is it? It's like hyphenated. Max bus power 100. Okay, so it looks like it takes the current settings 
nothing has changed. And now if I come up here, my max bus power is probably going to say 100 now. Yep, right there. Everything else should be the same, which looks correct. And so I'm going to say yes this time. Yes. And apparently it's done. So now, I wonder if it automatically reboots or if I have to unplug it and plug it back in. Okay, it still says 90, which I would expect because it, it never disconnected. So the, the host didn't have to re-enumerate it. So great, it says 90. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug it. And then I'm going to plug it back in. There we go. Let's run it again. Look at that. Success. Okay. That was crazy easy. And I wonder... Now that I know what the, now what I know what the serial number is, that DT03, I'd love to see it in, uh, what happened to my Visual Studio Code? Did I close it? Apparently I closed it. Settings, show hex dump. Oh, no, it is. It's a string right here. So of two bytes, it looks like. Not two bytes. That would be... Let's see. Da, 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 da. What am I thinking here? Yeah, two, yeah, two byte. Because each of these is a byte. Four four is one byte. Okay, and so I could create, I, I could programmatically create these. Yeah, but if, I, if all I wanna do is change a couple of things, I might as well just run the commands. I'll worry about that later. Anyway, I was just thinking ahead of like how to make programming super automated. Um, we'll worry about that later okay so we just successfully changed the the programming of the ftdi chip and so we should also just like we did before let's just try one of these really quick the vid and pit are still 403 uh, and 6015 403 and 6015 great Okay, I'm gonna close this and just for fun, let's change CBUS zero. Let's change CBUS one. We're gonna change CBUS one just to see how that works. And then we'll call it, we'll call it a stream after that. We've, we've made some excellent progress here. So let's change CBUS one to power enable. Um, so right now you can see CBUS1 is RX LED. And we can do power enable. I don't like how it says CBUS1 through 7 because right here... You can see it's CBUS zero. Oh, but it goes through six. And so uh, I kind of hate that, but that's whatever. That's part of the program here. It, it, the CBUSes are zero indexed, but the FTX prog is one basing them. So CBUS zero is going to be one. So we do CBUS one power enable. Okay. So we're going to do... FTX prog, CBUS one, and then power enable like that. I think that's the form that we want to do. 
dash dash cbus the number and then the option. cbus one power enable. Hit enter. Inappropriate. Oh, got to do sudo. Okay. And now look at that. It changed from the LED, RX LED, I think is what it was, to power enable. I'm going to say yes. And the end. Now that's set to power enable. It doesn't really matter because as you can see right now, our, none of our CBUS lines are connected. They're all floating on the actual hardware. Okay, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to accomplish. Now I just need to figure out how to connect, again, how to connect these CBUS lines back over to our BQ chip, the PMIC, to create the power profile that we want the device to have. I think we're in a really good spot. I think that's a great place to uh, call the stream. Appreciate anybody that joined and watched King. It was great having you. Hope uh, you found some of that interesting and useful. Uh, anybody else that uh, popped in, really great to have you. Hope you have an amazing rest of your day and week. And we should be back uh, tomorrow, hopefully, uh, continuing on on building an ESP32-based Internet of Things product. So thanks for joining me and have a good one.